to the Responsible AI podcast from Fiddler AI. My name is Anusha Sitaraman, the VP of Marketing at Fiddler, and I'm excited to host the show. This is a place to chat about all things responsible AI, the practice of building AI that is transparent, accountable, ethical, and reliable. We chat with different guests with expertise in this space, including researchers, industry leaders, and AI ethics experts. If you have any questions or suggestions for speakers, please reach out to us at podcast at fiddler.ai. We also host a weekly chat on Clubhouse every Friday at noon Pacific time on Responsible AI. And we also have a club on Clubhouse, Responsible AI and ML. So please join us there. Hope you enjoy the show. All right. So today I have with me Anand Rao, who is the global AI lead at PwC. Thanks so much for joining us, Anand. It's really exciting to have you on the show today. Um, we'd love to hear an introduction from yourself about what you do. Thanks, uh, Anusha. Really uh, happy to be here, and uh, uh, thanks for inviting me to your uh, uh, to your show. Uh, just to give you a little bit of background, as you said, uh, I'm the global AI lead uh, for PwC. Uh, I came to this role by interesting coincidence of different events. My background is in AI. In the way back in the 80s, I did my PhD in AI from uh, Australia, from University of Sydney. Spent a year with the, the TJ, IBM TJ Watson Research Center. Went back and started uh, in a uh, startup company in Melbourne, in Australia. So spent around 15 years working in the hardcore technology of AI. Um, it was around what is called multi-agent systems, uh, primarily targeted at the aerospace defense industry and telecommunications, uh, but it was more around multi-agent systems and simulations. Uh, how how uh, AI can make real-time decisions is what we were after. Uh, sometime along the way, I think the AI winter hit and I shifted mm -hmm. from being a technologist to uh, more on the business side. So I did my MBA and then converted more into the business. Spent another 10 years or so, both in Australia and in London and in UK, uh, more around talking to our business clients and helping them with their strategy, more on the, the strategy side of the, uh, the, the companies as opposed to the technology side. And uh, uh, around 2010, uh, the, the management consulting company that I was part of was bought by PwC. It, we, it. we came into an acquisition, and that's when we were part of a much larger group, right? So a huge organization, a number of analytics, AI groups, data groups. And so I was part of a team which basically brought everything together and started developing various offerings, helping our clients both um, go through the whole transition around big data, around analytics, and we had always been doing some of the AI work, so naturally fit very much into that AI role. Uh, initially, it was more helping clients with adopting AI, building AI models, machine learning models, natural language processing models, uh, simulation models, and so on. And I would say more like four or five years, maybe around 2015, uh, clients started asking more about the risks of AI. And mm -hmm. that's when we started the journey around responsible AI, looking at the risks of AI and how to mitigate some of those risks, the ethics of AI, and then how to operationalize all of these things. And we also got very much involved on a global scale with a number of countries that were coming up with the national AI strategy. So we are working as a firm, we are working with more than 25 plus countries on their national AI strategy. So that's what brought me into the whole area of responsible AI. Got it. So jumping right into it, what does responsible AI mean to you? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. So to me, uh, anyone who does AI should be doing it responsibly, right? right? So, um, yeah. and, and, and uh, I joke with my, my colleagues, so you can't go and tell a client that, hey, we are doing AI, but we are doing it irresponsibly, uh, <laughs> right? So no to want to uh, enter into a contract with you. So every AI that we do should be responsible. Then, then why, why even have that word responsible would be the question. To us, it is um, doing things in a way that is not just focused on the immediate task of mm -hmm. what that AI is solving, but to think about AI, not just as a machine and an algorithm that produces a result, 
to thinking about it as a what people in the academic world now call socio-technical system, right? So yeah. there's technology, there's people using the technology. And in that interface, how do we make sure that we are using the technology in the right way, right? So and the right way is there, what is that right way? And that's where we get into the details of what, what is the ethically the right thing for this human machine system should do. So we get into the notion of ethics, which again comes from a broader set of ethics. There is a number of uh, people who have been looking at AI ethics and what should that be? And then of course, some of them translates into uh, law, regulation and law, uh, others don't. So we often tell our clients, you need to do certain things because that's the right thing to do, mm-hmm. not necessarily that there is a regulation today or might come in tomorrow, but you, you should do it while, while uh, because it is ethical to do. Then it comes into, I think, uh, uh, very much around what we have heard of bias and fairness. So mm-hmm. is the it's not you can't just say the algorithm came up with the answer. That's and right. I don't know whether it is fair or not, right? So yeah. I was just sort of using the model, yeah. right? So that's not a good defense. We need yeah. to understand how the model works and whether it is taking in institutional bias, right? So historical yeah. bias, institutional if that's being encoded, we need to be very conscious as data scientists. As a data scientist, I would probably say, hey, give me the data, I'll cleanse the data, I'll give you the results, I'll maximize the uh, accuracy, but that alone is not sufficient, right? So the difference between a responsible AI and AI is AI or a data scientist would say, hey, my task is just to give you the best accuracy you can, but we would say, no, 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 no. you need to understand a much broader uh, uh, area around where this model is being used, how it's being used, and look at not just accuracy as a criteria, look at fairness as a criteria, look at biases that yeah. could come into the data set or into the way of it is designed, uh, make sure that it is explainable to a layperson or to a regulator or to a business user. All that is part of the job that you do, right? So yeah. it should be transparent. All of these things come in. So that's yeah. what really means to be in a responsible AI. And how do we govern all of these things? So it's the uh, people are doing the right thing and, and the algorithms are doing the right thing and someone is checking it, the whole governance comes in. So that's our view of AI, right? So AI, which is sort of embedded in a broader context, a societal context on where and how these decisions are being used and how do we ensure that it is done appropriately. Yeah, that makes sense. And I really resonated with that. You know, you can't just leave it to the algorithm and say, hey, it's just because of the algorithm saying this, that's, I can't do anything about it. That's what happened with the Apple card issue, if you remember, and the customer support team was saying, hey, it's the algorithm, we can't really do anything, but that's just unacceptable. Completely agree. So you mentioned AI risks, Anand. Um, So I wanted to touch upon that a little bit because you had a really interesting article where you talked about AI risks and you talked about the five dimensions over there. Would love to share that with the audience as well. Yeah. So when we when we look at risk, this is something I think we were approaching it. I think one of the very early uh, groups approaching it from a risk perspective. Uh, obviously, we are we are a risk and regulation firm. One would say, right? So we are very much mm-hmm. in the audit assurance business as a, as a large group as PwC. So when we were looking at it, we wanted to make sure that we are looking at not only the opportunities that AI offers, but are also cognizant of the risks and not not to the view to don't do AI, but more to the to a view that. Hey, do it uh, by mitigating some of those risks. So mm-hmm. that's the key reason for us to understand those risks. So mm-hmm. now go back and say, so what are some of those risks? And mm-hmm. again, if you look into responsible AI and all the things that are going on, uh, people talk about risk in various different ways. So one of the things that uh, we started looking at is what are the different dimensions? So mm-hmm. I'll just go through a few of them, right? So first one is that time dimension. Now, mm-hmm. In AI, very often we mix the Hollywood scenario of a, um, uh, of a robot going uh, uh, around streets shooting people uh, uh, and, and so on, right? So, so mm. the typical Hollywood view and people start worrying about, hey, is, uh, are these robots coming and taking over my job and, and ruling over me and so on? And I know there have been a number of books written around artificial yeah. general intelligence and super intelligence and so on. Those things are, I I think there are valid concerns. I don't want to dismiss those concerns. They are valid concerns, 
but they are of a much longer time frame. And yes, there should be a group of people looking at it. We should be addressing some of those so we can consciously move in certain directions and avoid certain directions. But that's not the primary thing for most organizations, I would say, right? So they have immediate problems. They build a chatbot, they release the chatbot. Obviously everyone has got a chatbot these days. How do they even know whether the chatbot is performing in the same way that it was performing six months back when you trained with your old data? Right. So is as the data changed, is, is it still performing? Do you know? Uh, do you know when it starts deviating? So I think those are more immediate concerns mm -hmm. that that uh, that one should be thinking. So there's a time dimension. So that's one. So there's either a near term, mid term, long term uh, dimension in which risks uh, uh, manifest themselves and you need to be cognizant. The second one is much more around uh, the stakeholder dimension. So is this impacting every person, every institution, certain groups of people, not certain others, right? So uh, yeah. who is the beneficiary or, or the one being affected? And there's a lot of work now trying to look yeah. at the societal impact of some of these things. That's the second part. Yeah. Then the, the risk also is very much uh, around very specific sectors, which is the third part and use cases, right? So financial services is very specific types of risk. And That's within right. that, but the use case, you would have certain type of risk. So you do need yeah. to go to that level. We can't stay at the high level and say, oh yeah, there is a reputational risk. So you need to mm -hmm. quantify that where exactly is it, by what means is that, uh, that uh, reputation risk. And the fifth one is the socio-technical dimension, right? So where we talk about bias, fairness, safety, accuracy, uh, transparency. Those are all interesting properties that we need to have. Yeah. But interestingly, it's not, a, it's not a yes or no answer. There's sort of shades of gray there. And there's a lot of balancing that needs to be done yeah. between fairness and accuracy, explainability, uh, robustness, and so on. So it's not one answer. So there's a trade-off happening there. So those are all the five dimensions in which we look at uh, uh, risk and go into one, some of these details. Thank you, Anand. One of the things I remember reading when you were... Um, talking about some of these things was around um, this. Uh, so you mentioned shades of gray, right? Like legally uh, allowed, but ethically questionable. Questionable. So I was curious, what do you mean by that? And what do most companies do in your experience in a situation like this? Yeah, no, they, that's, that's a very good point, right? So now um, what's happening with this area is now we are discovering a number of things where the AI has gone bad, right? That's so right. where there is some, some impact of AI. Now, the, the, the regulations and laws are not quite there yet, right? So now if companies are saying, uh, which many companies are saying this, right? So let the regulation come mm -hmm. and then I'll abide by those regulations, mm -hmm. right? So Currently, there is no regulation to for me to uh, go in and explain my algorithm, or to uh, 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 or to make sure that I'm transparent, right? So, yeah. or my models are interpretable. Uh, so, I don't need to do anything, right? So, I think that is a wrong attitude, right? So, for example, if uh, if I'm building a model that is making a decision, let's just say uh, it's uh, telling me whether I should have a home loan or not. Now, mm -hmm. if the consumer comes and asks, hey, why, why was my loan denied? Uh, and you're using a model to come up with that, you need to have an adequate explanation that meets the customer's criteria, yeah. right? So, and you can't say the model said so or explain it right. in a way that Hey, we have a threshold of 633 and uh, you were only 620, so you couldn't meet it and you couldn't get the thing, right? So yes, from a technical perspective, it may be right, right? So you might have some score that is computed, but that's not of any use to the customer. You need to tell the customer, we look at five different factors. You satisfied four of those factors. In this fifth factor, mm -hmm. you fell short by X percent. And if you did this, if you waited for six more months and applied it, then you will get a home loan. Or we cannot give you 90% of the value. We can give you 85% of the value, right? So of the value of the home, then that's that right. becomes an actionable explanation. So 
you need to do these things, whether there is a law or not, right? So the, the regulation might come or even may not come, but this is the right thing to do. It is the right practice uh, to be able to gain the trust of the people, right? So the, the key thing here is when would customers tra start trusting uh, the decisions uh, that, that you are using the, the, the machine for or an algorithm for? I think for that reason you need to do to build the trust uh, from the customers on your products and make sure that that uh, they are comfortable with it. So that's the reason why you should be doing things in an ethical manner, as opposed to waiting for a regulation. This is an interesting point because one of the things I think your survey revealed was that um, AI ethics is still not on the horizon for multiple companies. So, uh, Obviously, like this could be because, hey, we, there's no real regulation. It's kind of something that you have to self-regulate, do on your own. So why do you think this is? And also, how do you think this will evolve over the next few years, right? Yeah. Um, yes, you're right. So we did a, we did a global survey uh, across US, UK, India, and uh and Japan, and then we mm -hmm. also did a more in-depth survey in US, and it's sort of a very consistent results mm -hmm. that uh, a lot of people are talking about some of these things, but there is very little action uh, yeah. of how do we actually go about doing it. And uh, I should say there is no action because mm -hmm. we have seen that uh, when we looked at the data, we were able to uh, split them into sort of three categories. So there's mm -hmm. roughly, um, quarter of the, the, the survey respondents are doing something, right? So we call them the AI leaders and yeah. in a number of things they are pushing forward. And then there's another group which are more experimenting and then they are AI laggards, right? So the experimental yeah. group is probably around 60%, 58%, 60%, uh, which is the bulk. Uh, and then there are a few people who haven't really quite jumped in yet, right? So just exploring. Yeah. So when you look at that group, the, the ones that are more the AI leaders are doing things in terms of having a proper governance across their entire system, uh, making sure that they are taking into account ethics in their policies and the strategies and so on. But the bulk of this uh, 58 odd group is not doing that, right? So, and part of that is again, because there is no right tooling, uh, there's no right regulations, there's no framework, uh, not, I should say, no, there are too many frameworks, there are too many documents, there are too many of those, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. standardizing and, and doing all of those is a lot of work, and that's why they're not doing it, or, or they maybe intend to do it, but haven't done it yet. So we think that this will move, right, so as more regulations are coming through in yeah. EU, I mean, might even be as early as uh, in a couple of months, we might see That's some regulations right. or yeah. draft regulation, then that might force um, a certain level of standardization and action more importantly. And, and I'm pretty sure that I think the US will also start reacting to some of these things in a global perspective. So I think there will be action. It's just a question of timing. Uh, and what we want to do is just make sure that the companies are ready when these mm -hmm. things come and start doing it right away. So in the meantime, before these regulations come and for companies to get ready, you mentioned a few things around these three lines of defense in terms of how companies mm -hmm. should think about it. And you also talk about this end-to-end -end governance framework. So can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, so one of the things that when we started uh, looking at this, uh, Again, companies are very loath to get onto yet another new bandwagon and a new process and everything new, right? So we were just looking at models that have worked in mm -hmm. other areas, right? So right. again, AI is just a evolution. Yes, it does certain things, but there have been other models as well where people have to uh, uh, cope with some of the risks or some of the things that are going wrong and some of them are making uh, substantive decisions, right? So even the, uh, the mortgage model that I talked about is very well regulated, right? So mm -hmm. it's not a, uh, anyone can go and build a, a mortgage model. So it has to be approved and, and overseen by the regulators. So that says there are, especially in financial services, when we looked at all the different sectors, financial mm -hmm. sectors uh, have been doing this for almost 25 years now, where individual companies can go ahead and build their own models using their data, using their customer data, they'll build the model, but 
there are some standards by which they should be building it and the standards by which yeah. they are being monitored by the supervisors, all of that. So we actually took that as a template and said, you don't have to wholesale introduce a new one or change things, but you can adapt your existing processes. So one of the things that is well, well, well established in the financial services and other areas as well is this three lines of defense, right? So there's mm -hmm. someone actually building the models, right? So that's the first line. So the business and the, and the data scientists, data engineers, machine learning people, they're all building that. So that's the first line. Then typically you have a compliance uh, group, which is close enough, but independent of this group that is actually checking, right? So the second line is checking what the first line is doing. Mm -hmm. And of course there is a detailed guidance on how do you take the data? How do you measure uh, things like accuracy, um, have a holdout sample, right? So training set, validation set, data, test data, all of those, right? So there are procedures that can be followed. So that's what the second line so does. And what do you the provide first. details on those procedures? Like, do you say, hey, yes. this is exactly how you need to do this, like a checklist or something like that? That's, yeah, that's, that's exactly what we do, right? So we, again, take the process, uh, so there's a first and second line. The third line is an internal audit, which looks more at the process as everyone followed the process. Then sometimes okay. you have external, audit, you have regulators and so on. Now, now to answer your question around the, the details, yes. So we would take uh, right from the point that someone says, hey, we need to build um, a model, right? So again, we have to define what a model is or what a yeah. machine learning model is or what an AI system is. And then whenever it starts being as a concept or ideation, that's where you start and say, okay, so let's go and get more information about what is it that you are building, right? So, uh, and what decision are you, is this model going to be making? What prediction or decision is this model going to be predicting? Who is it going to be impacting, right? So who's going to be using it? What data do you have to feed into the model? If you don't have any data, then it's probably uh, algorithm, code, rule-based, some, something else, not, not a machine learning model, but a non-machine learning. It could still be a model that you're building. So try and understand that and say what would be a uh, be the performance criteria for this model to be deployed right so what is my accuracy what is my uh, definition or metric for fairness so uh, mm -hmm. how explainable do i want my model to be to whom right so all of those are things that you would say initially and then go and build the model so we would go into the details of what are some of the requirements to do this who should be testing and how should they be so we call this end to end governance right so right from the point it is the ideation starts uh, to scoping the model building the model and if there is the right results not all models can be deployed once you get to a stage where you say yes it is giving me all the right performance metrics that we initially started with, then you start deploying the model and then obviously uh, make sure that you're in the deployment, you are testing the model and, and monitoring the model, and then you make yeah. it business as you. So this whole thing is something that I think organizations need to adopt, right? So um, very similar to the SD, SL, uh, SDLC um, uh, software development life cycle. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we came up with the agile cycle. There are a number of methodologies and now it's sort of the agile life cycle that software is, form of, is using. Similarly for model development, you need to have some of these things well specified. So it becomes consistent. Data scientists can do it. ML engineers can do it. And someone is there to check. So currently it's a wild west. Anyone can do anything, just get it, something deployed. So we're trying to get some of those standards in. So you mentioned a couple of things here that I just wanted to ask a question on. So you said, you know, what, what do you make it explainable for and for whom? Uh, and what, some of those uh, guidelines, do you say, hey, if you're in this particular use case and this industry, based on those sort of risks and um, factors that you mentioned earlier on, do you say based on all of these things, these are the potential questions that you want to answer when considering this type of an AI use case. Is that that's something right. that that's you provide? Yeah. Yes, that's something that we provide, right? So something that we might do on a case by case, use case by use case basis. But then there are general methodologies, right? So whenever you build a model, uh, just think through some of those questions. So uh, what decision is it making? Who is it for? Right, yeah. so so that the explanation becomes clear, uh, and then uh, what what uh, who how when 
where all of those, right? So yeah. when is that model going to be used, right? So, and, and where, if there is a location specific thing, then, then there is a where to it. And why is this model being built, right? So all of those questions need to be answered. So we have a series of questions. And then when you look at the who, you can uh, uh, say, uh, get people to think in terms of uh, different stakeholders or mm -hmm. in uh, personas, right? So hey, is it an end user? If it is an end user, are there different types of end users? Is it a uh, mathematically savvy end user or mm -hmm. is it... Uh, 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 a Joe Bloggs uh, who, mm -hmm. who doesn't have any of the statistical background. So that also makes a, uh, uh, makes a point, right? So you might be building a system for, let's say a clinical expert looking at uh, 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 x-rays, right? So, and then making some decisions. So they are technically competent and obviously we're very much an expert in the clinician side. So you mm -hmm. need to know their language to be able to explain yeah. it. Uh, yeah. Whereas for a for a mortgage loan, it would be a very different kind of an explanation and a, a maybe an English language description, as opposed to showing them nice graphs and uh, uh, thresholds and so on, right? So it doesn't, I mean, most people wouldn't, wouldn't want to look at a graph and say, oh, this is why I didn't get my loan. You want mm -hmm. to explain in plain English. So, so that's what we force people to think through that. Who are the different stakeholders? When would they be using the system? And how would they be using it, right? So again, if someone is checking on their smartphone and you need a quick answer, you're not going to be uh, giving a, a long passage and an essay on, on, on how the system came up with the decision, right? So you need to be, so you need to understand all of those in order to design. So now it becomes a uh, a, a task not just for the data scientists, but but for a broader person, a business person, or a software person to think through all of those. Got it. Yeah, that's helpful. So, uh, given some of these challenges here that companies face when adopting AI and also like trying making sure that it's responsible, do you feel like tools like this would help them accelerate their processes? Um, and in relation to this, I think one of the things you mentioned was these six stage gates in terms of how to think about it. So it would be great if you could just talk a little bit about that. And I have a couple of specific questions about a couple of the gates. Okay, yeah. Um, I would say, so there are a couple of things, I would say at least there are three things that are needed for some of these things to really become operational. Uh, so on the first level, I would say there needs to be a, uh, quite a bit of standardization, methodology, framework, right? So that's coming. So IEEE and a number of organizations are looking at it and EU and, and a number of groups have said, hey, if you're developing models, you need to follow these kinds of steps, right? So you need to do X, Y, Z. So there is a standardized way or methodology for building models using data and embedding them into software is coming. So that's the number one, right? So methodology, framework, all of that. Uh, mm -hmm. The second one, uh, I would then say you need the right tooling, right? So toolkit and tools, technologies to be able to do that. Just as in yeah. the software engineering or in the agile method, you have the tools which enable the pro product managers, program managers to do this process and for others to uh, essentially comply to that. So similarly for this model development, you need... Uh, uh, basically the technology to go and deploy it, right? So automate it. If you're trying to do uh, literally hundreds of model deployments on a, uh, a, on, a re on a daily basis, then you're going to consume a lot of resources. You want to automate them so you don't want to do them yeah. manually. So there are, there's a whole host of technology solutions that can help in, the, in standardizing that framework. And lastly, it is more the, the people and the process part of it, right? So you want people trained in this so that they understand fully all the different things. So, so far data science has been more like a, artisan shop, right? So you go mm -hmm. there and each one makes their own little pot and they're very proud of the pot that they make, but each one is different. From mm -hmm. there, we are going to a factory that is still making pots, but that's churning out in the hundreds, right? Mm -hmm. So all looking uniform, it might still be a very creative pot, but it's probably making uniform set of 10,000 of those, right? So we are moving from uh, each artisan group of data scientists to a factory, we sometimes call it a model factory, where you can mm -hmm. churn this out with a, a reasonable level of consistency, standardization, and so on. So they are easier to maintain for someone who really is not uh, mm -hmm. a craftsperson. 
right? Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. that's where that, that's what's happening. So those three, I think, would be uh, essential uh, things to have. Got it. Well, thank you. So two questions on these stages. One thing I read was around the societal and ethical impact and harms assessments. So what what do you mean by that, and how should people think about it? Yeah. So one of the things that we are very conscious of is, again, it's, it's easy for everyone to fall into a trap of, we need more documentation. We need more documentation, right? So yeah. keep giving more and more, then we are going to burden all the data scientists and, and people who like to explore. So instead, what I think you, we want to do is to be more measured, right? So now, if a model is being used for some very critical decisions, then it needs to be built or at least productionized in a way that's very rigorous, right? So there's all the traceability and tractability to yeah. it. But if you're just experimenting with something, you probably don't want these data scientists to be saddled with a whole host of different processes. So that's why right at the front, we are mm -hmm. saying, you do some kind of a first a risk assessment and mm -hmm. also a harm assessment in terms mm -hmm. of if the model is being used, uh, how many people are going to be using it, right? So, mm -hmm. and what impact would it have if the model goes wrong? Is it, for example, targeting model, you target someone wrongly, uh, mm -hmm. the worst they can say is they can be annoyed with you and say, I don't want to buy this product or you might even lose a customer, but you're yeah. not really impacting their life, right? So on the other hand, if you have denied someone a job when you shouldn't have denied or mm -hmm. denied someone a loan, then that's more consequences from a financial economic perspective. And then you can take it further in terms of what about a health decisions, right? So if someone doesn't have a cancer and you're saying they have cancer or vice versa, either way, right? So is that something uh, that we should just let the machine or how, how does that human machine interface work, right? So the risk obviously in each one of these sort of gets more and more complicated. And that's why yeah. we say you need to understand how this model gets used. And that's why that harms assessment is both the magnitude of that risk and the frequency of that risk, right? So again, risk is sort of the magnitude and frequency. Then you can say, hey, for some of these things where either they might occur very few times, but when it occurs, it sort of it blows up, right? So it's a huge exposure or whatever way you decide, then that requires more rigorous documentation control everyone needs to sign off on. Uh, whereas some of the things that, let's say, just a small group of five people are going to be using it within your thing, you don't need to go through all this process. So that's one of the main reasons why uh, people call it risk tiering. You can uh, typically you have three or five levels of risk tiering, and that allows you to just do all of these things with the appropriate cost, right? So if it is a high risk uh, model then, or I impact model, a high risk model, then you yeah. need a, a much more rigorous way. If it is less rigorous, then you can do uh, level one. So you're sort of quantifying the, the work that way based on the risk. Got it. So now once you've actually like put or finished developing your model, one of the stage gates you mentioned is around when do you determine that the model is ready for business as usual? So what mm -hmm. does this involve? Like you talk about this concept of monitoring models and how it's different for traditional software and for AI and ML models. Would love to learn what you think about that. Yeah, no, that's, that's right. So in one of our stage gates, once we know that the model uh, is ready for deployment, we deploy yeah. the model. And if you, when I say deploy the model or deploy a software, when we deploy a software or, or install or productionize a software, um, Obviously, you have tested the more software before it gets released. As long as you have passed all the tests, that software will perform as advertised mm -hmm. uh, until the specification changes, right? So it is performing all of the activities. Now, you can't say the same thing with machine learning models. Mm -hmm. uh, why? Right? So the machine learning models are using data. So based on the data, uh, we have built the model and we have a certain accuracy. Now, at the time of production, we have basically used the training data to come up with the model and then the model goes into production. Now, when it goes into production, the data that it is seeing is different to the data yeah. that we had in the training, right? So 
we expect it to work, right? So otherwise yeah. we wouldn't release the model. We think that the that the data that we have is representative of what it's likely to get, but it may not be, right? So it may not be for a couple of reasons. So one is um, uh, that the training data that you have used is not representative of the whole one, right? So now okay. you start getting more data from different places and then yeah. the performance starts deteriorating. It could improve, but it could also deteriorate. So that's mm -hmm. one reason why you need to do it. Then the second one would also be the, the customer preferences might also be changing or the world, the environment might be changing. So mm -hmm. in that sense, uh, you need to constantly update the uh, predictions or the machine learning algorithm based on newer data. So in order to understand that, I think you need to have some period, which again, depends on how frequently you're running the model. It could be um, a, a week, a month, a quarter, even a year, right? Mm -hmm. So where you're essentially monitoring the model and seeing whether the performance is still true to what was the original spec or when you trained the model, if it is, then it goes into business as usual. Even when it goes into business as usual, you still need to keep monitoring it. There That's is an right. ongoing monitoring piece. Again, software also needs to be monitored, but this as a way in which you may have to redo the model uh, on the fly or, or, or pull the, use the data, rebuild the model, and then in, in install the new model. There are all of those sort of mechanics that are now coming through, but this process itself should be clear when we are deploying the model as to a, when, when can we make this model business as usual and what how frequently should we be reviewing these models on an ongoing basis, I think is very critical uh, as it comes, uh, as it applies to the models. So in your experience, what um, what are the maybe like the two or three main challenges that teams are facing today as they go or embark on this responsible AI journey? Yeah, when they go on this responsible AI journey, I would say there's sort of three major challenges on the way they should be thinking about it. So the first one is if you want to. Um, uh, be successful in AI, um, I think what's clear from what companies are doing in our surveys is that it's not enough if you just do a proof of concept, right? Mm -hmm. So you really should be deploying models uh, in production, uh, interfaced with all of the other systems and have your front end people or whoever it is to use it. So you need production models not mm -hmm. experimental models. So that's one. So the challenge then, uh, back to everything that we just discussed, it's around the process, making sure that we are following that model development process uh, and, and doing all of the different steps that we just went through, right? So putting models in operation, I think is the first challenge. And again, doing it in a way that is cost-effective, cost-efficient, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. uh, automated is where, where the challenges are. The second set of challenges are, again, in, when, I, when we look at companies, uh, there's often a focus on ROI, which mm -hmm. it should be, right? There should be a focus on ROI, but the way we think about ROI needs to be fundamentally different to the way we think about ROI for software, right? Mm -hmm. So typically what uh, executives do is to think of uh, data science in the same bucket as software and mm -hmm. say, tell me how much are we going to generate for this particular system or model? Now, when you're asking for the model, that's the wrong way to look at it because when you start a priori, you don't know whether the model will be successful or not, whether a single model will be successful or not. Um, it's more like a, a, a drug discovery or a pharma uh, pipeline, drug creation pipeline. So when mm -hmm. you start producing drugs, you can't be 100% certain that in three months I'll produce a, uh, a vaccine or drug that mm -hmm. is 95% efficacy. Uh, you, no one can guarantee that, right? So what you can say is, I know these techniques, I'm going to be trying this, I'm going to do a phase one trial, phase two trial, phase three trial, each of these takes X number of months and each at each stage I'll publish results on how effective the model is or how effective the drug is. That's what, so the, the way the pharma companies survive is that they have a portfolio, right? So they have a portfolio of different 
combinations of drugs that they are trying, they know that not all of them are going to be successful. They just hope that one or two of them will be blockbusters so that they, they survive the overall. Now, just sort of, that's all pharma, right? So drug, uh, uh, drug discovery. Now mm-hmm. translate the same thing in terms of models, unless it is a model that we have done 15, 20 times and it's just a tweaking of a model, we should be thinking about models more in this portfolio approach, right? Mm-hmm. So if you have a portfolio of models, uh, try some of them which are much more exploratory where no one else has done. There may be more traditional models. I mean, segmenting more, doing a segmentation of your customers. That's well tried. So many people have done it. So you can easily come up with X number of segments, right? So using mm-hmm. whatever came clustering, that's not something that you really need to sweat about. And, and that's something that you can get an ROI if you can prove that you have the segments. And if you have a segment driven targeted strategy, you'll do better than an unsegmented strategy, right? Mm-hmm. So there you can say, but in other cases, you may not be able to. So you need to have a portfolio and then make sure that in that portfolio, there are things that people have tried enough. So you know that they are very likely to be successful. You just have to follow the process versus certain others where you're not sure and you need to experiment with it. So, so that's the second one I would say that companies have a lot of challenge. And when we talk to people, they just say, hey, just give me an ROI, right? So we can't give you an ROI for a single data science uh, experiment. We can give you an ROI for a portfolio and say, how should you manage a portfolio, right? Mm-hmm. So, but you should still expect a portfolio return, like what the pharma folks look at or, or even the financial services people look at a portfolio. No mm-hmm. single stock can be guaranteed to perform but a portfolio uh, can yeah. be, uh, you can measure the, the return on a portfolio depending on the mm-hmm. market conditions. So that's a very similar one. And the last one I would say is all the discussion that we have had is be very conscious about some of the risks of AI so that mm-hmm. you embed I think ethically aligned design is what people talk about. So embed some of those principles right at the start and it's not an afterthought. It's not a compliance uh, uh, a problem to go and look for explainability of your model or fairness mm-hmm. of your model after you have built it. You should be looking at it right at the beginning. Otherwise, you're going to be wasting your entire effort and then going back and discovering that your data was biased and you just need to rebuild it with a normalized data sets, right? So you're mm-hmm. better off doing it at the first, not at the end when you're checking the model. So those three would be the ones. So it's basically putting your models in operation, uh, focusing on a portfolio for your mm-hmm. ROI, and looking at your uh, uh, risks and mitigating those risks. Got it. Well, thank you. Would that be, I, I guess I should have phrased that question a little bit differently more on like, what's your top advice, two to three points of advice for um, customers today when they think about responsibly. I think that aligns better. Yes. I yes. said challenges, um, but never mind. That was great. Thanks for that. So last question, Anand, how do you think responsibly is going to evolve over the next few years? Um, you know, maybe if you do a serve, the same survey that you did uh, two years from now, do you think that the results would be significantly different, for example? Yeah, no, good question. So we are hoping that at least three years from now, everyone would be doing some of those. Yeah. And uh, again, the, the same statement I started earlier on, I would hope that we don't have to use the prefix responsible when we talk about okay. AI. It's yeah. almost taken for granted that when someone says AI, it is done in the right way. So people have made sure that they have done all the testing on the adversarial attacks. It is uh, yeah. uh, explainable to the extent that it can be. And it is sort of uh, uh, all the bias has been removed it's to some extent, the extent mm-hmm. it can. All of those things, right, that we talk about is already done. So we don't have yeah. to keep mentioning responsible. Everyone is doing it in a responsible manner. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Anand. Really appreciate all of your insights and time here today. Um, Thanks for joining us. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Enjoyed talking with you.